This P-47 and this A-20 are just two of the Lewis Air Legends airplanes. Rod Lewis has 24 legendary aircraft in his collection, mostly warbirds, and each one has stories to tell that could fascinate us through the day and on into the night. Rod is committed to maintaining and sharing the history of these airplanes and their roles in protecting our country. Those stories and about the pilots who flew these planes are coming up. And speaking of pilots, there are pilots, there are really good pilots, and then once in a while, a pilot comes along who is so extraordinary, both as a pilot and as a person in the air and on the ground, that it's impossible to adequately describe that person. There is a man who fits that description. Oh, I see you spotted the name in the plane, Bob Hoover. He used to be a test pilot, one of the best. Today, he's manager of customer relations for North American's Los Angeles division, and he's the man who demonstrates this plane. Well, uh, here he comes now. You know, he flies this plane in a business suit and without a parachute. Hi, Bob. We've just been admiring this beauty of yours. Beauty she is, and she flies like a dream. Tell you what, folks, climb in with me now, and let's see what we can do. In the air in World War II, he fought to save our country from those who would try to take away our freedoms. On the ground, he has committed himself to our country's values and has always reflected those values in his own daily life so that we never forget who we are as Americans and how so many have given their lives to keep America safe and free. He soloed at 16, but then had to teach himself aerobatics to overcome air sickness. A few years later, in Air Corps primary pilot training, he was so good at aerobatics that his commander had him teach all of his instructors aerobatics. He flew combat in Europe, was taken prisoner in Germany, he escaped and commandeered a German Focke-Wolf 190 and flew it to Holland. After the war, uh, as a test pilot, he flew hundreds of different models of airplanes. One flight, October 14, 1947, he flew chase on the Bell XS-1. That was man's first successful supersonic flight when the pilot lived to tell about it. Yes, he took that famous photo of the bullet-shaped rocket plane breaking the sound barrier. And who can ever forget the first time they saw Bob fly his Mustang and Shrike Commander in air shows around the world? Jimmy Doolittle introduced him as the greatest stick and rudder pilot who ever lived. Please welcome Bob Hoover. Right out in front here. Yeah, wait, please. That's great. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Morning, Bob. In um, on April second this year at uh, Uverhadze uh, Smithsonian Air and Space. Um, the second bronze life-size statue of an aviator was unveiled at Uverhadze, and it was of Bob Hoover. The first and the only other, other life-size statue at Smithsonian is Billy Mitchell. So Bob is in rare company, and so is Billy Mitchell. <laughs> Bob, good morning. <clears throat> My dear friend, what a treat to be with you. 
And what a treat to be with you again as well. Good morning. Uh, Bob, what does that mean to you? When we were there that night at Uverhadze in April, and to have that statue of you, and you've already got your two airplanes there, the Aero Commander and the Mustang, are in the museum. What, what do those honors mean to you coming from Smithsonian and the aviation community? Well, the truth of the matter is, there are far more people that deserve this than, than I ever was capable of receiving it. But I am tickled to death because so many people believed in what I did and why I did it, and they donated an enormous amount of money. And uh, I guess it, it got into the real big dollars, and all of the money over and above the cost of the statue went to the museum. And uh, I've done a lot of those kind of things uh, that I'm really proud of, and if you don't mind my bragging a little bit, I made $1,013,000 out of one movie at the premiere only. And the people who invested in the movie said, Bob, we, we made that donation and it's your money. What do you want to do with it? I said, I want to put it into aviation. And I donated the money to the Embry-Riddle Air, Air College and for scholarships. And I now had some classes graduating. And I'm very proud of it. Bob, thank you. Here we are to honor every year for a week honoring veterans. We have over 2 million veterans now in the United States, American veterans. When you think about our veterans today, what goes through your mind? Well, I can, I can respond to that easily. I have some very dear friends. I don't know how many of you know Mike Herman, but he uh, is, a, is a very dear close friend of mine, and he uses his private business jet every weekend that he can. He goes to a Veterans Administration hospital and finds some wounded soldier from one of our war days. And he says, when was the last time you saw your family? And the young man will say, it's been a very long time. I don't have the money or I'm too crippled to, to go visit him or, or, or we can't get to, I can't get to see my family. He flies them from wherever they live, the, or the, the, the veteran takes him, takes him to the, his home, goes back and picks him up three days later after, let's say on Sunday, and brings him back to the hospital. He has organized other people who have a private business jet and, and do just exactly what Mike has done, and I think he ought to get a big recognition. Mike Herman. Let's give it to him. And Mike, and Mike by the way, was the gentleman who, who came Mike out. Mike Herman. With, Mike came out with us just a few minutes ago. Bob, as many times as we've spoken and we've you know heard stories, and most of the people here know a lot of the stories about your career, but there are certain little details that sometimes get missed. And if you would, let me take you to a couple of those stories and try to recall some of the details. You heard in the video ahead about the fact, you know, Bob was shot down. He was 16 months of prisoner of war in Stalag 1 in northern Germany. He escaped. There was a uh, recently deserted uh, German airfield. He was able to get in the Falkwolf 190 and flew it with German markings, mind you, of course, across Germany to land in Holland. You landed in Holland in a field. Bob, how is it that you didn't get shot when you landed in, in Holland flying a German airplane? Well, I really had a problem. 
uh, Germany, when they retreated uh, all across North Africa, uh, when we would take over uh, an airfield, we couldn't land on it. Beautiful runway, because the Germans, when they deserted after we were pushing them back, they would put landmines in the runway. And when our forces came in, and we didn't have to do that but about once or twice, and we decided we don't land on an airfield that, that we have recovered from the Germans. And uh, on my escape, I've got to just back up and say, it was the dumbest thing anybody ever did. The war was two weeks from being over. The Germans were deserting. And I was so in the mind of escaping, and I had done nothing but try to escape from the day they got me, and I could talk to you for hours about the things I did and experienced. And it, to sum it all up, I was beaten up on many occasions for my attempts at escape when they recaptured me. And I never gave up going for it. And I got my inspiration from a, a colonel who was shot down before me. And he had uh, uh, heard from, he was a wonderful fighter pilot. Man. Russ Spicer. Russ Spicer, one of the finest people you've ever met. And, and Russ was captured, uh, and he was he was rescued. He was shot down in the P forty seven, as a matter of fact. And uh, he, he landed in the in the water, got in his life raft. It was the winter time on the Baltic Sea, and. Uh, by the time they recovered him, he had gotten up on the beach, and he was found unconscious by the Germans. And uh, they brought him into our prison camp, and he stood up and said, Gentlemen, General Patton, I've just learned, has gone out in front of all of his supply supports. And he had a, I think it was, almost 1,000 men, and the Germans realized that Patton had outrun his supply forces for ammunition, everything. He was so far ahead of the uh, troops coming in, and the, the Germans got smart, and they put a pincer and closed him in. So 1,000 men were, were right there captured. And the Germans came in and shot every one of them. Two of the people survived. And uh, they, they were received, a, they, 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 they recovered enough to, to where they brought them into the same hospital that I got ended up in, and, uh, in a prison camp. And, and I, got chance, I had a chance to visit with them. How much of an inspiration was Colonel Spicer to you? He was, I, 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 you know, he was like Jesus to me, I, somebody I wouldn't even talk to. I was only a flight officer. But when he made a speech and said what had happened, he said, remember, these are your enemy. I don't, know, don't want to see a single person in this prison camp, being friendly with the Germans or trying to be friendly, he said, just remember, they're your enemy. And uh, boy, I was motivated by him. He was a leader, if there ever was one. And even, even though General Eisenhower had spread the word, don't try to escape now, we're going to get you out here within a couple of weeks, but you did it anyway. Yeah. But every time I would get into, you know, I have to pay go with solitary confinement for trying to escape, and you don't have any daylight, and you don't know what day it is or anything. I ended up in the cell next to, to him, 
Mm. And he, he not when, we knew when the Germans were coming because we were on wooden planks in front of our, our cells, and you could hear them clanking. And so he would wait until the sounds were coming down, and he'd knock on the door and say, who's my neighbor? And I told him I was a flight officer. And he said, well, young man, what did you do to get in here? And I said, well, I attempted to escape again. And he said, I want you to know you're one of my heroes. And he said, when we get out of here, I'll never forget you. And every day, he didn't know whether he was going to live or die because they were going to put him before the firing squad. And uh, one of the great heroes in my life. And well, you know of him and heard of him. So True. It, it was he was a wonderful individual. So you got the ME 109, you got off again with German workings, and you flew across Germany to Holland. How did you know you were in Holland? Well, first of all, we went in to get, we were starving to death. And we went into a farmhouse. I knocked on the door, and a lady answered the phone. And I asked her if she spoke English. And she said, meaning a little bit. And so we tried to talk to her, and I told her we were escaped prisoners, and we were starving to death. And if she could give us something to eat, well, I'd like to leave a message that she had helped us, and so I wrote a note. She gave me some paper and a pencil, and I left a note saying that she had been helping, helping us on our escape. And, of course, we hadn't eaten eggs in a long, long time. That was really the first great breakfast I ever had. But she didn't read the note I left. And so after she fed us, I shook hands and thanked her, and my fellow that escaped with me, we hit the road. And uh, I, we were walking down this dirt road that came out to this farmhouse. And she came out and she was holding the letter, the little note that I'd written with, with a pencil. And she, and she was running and, and yelling. And I, I thought, oh my heavens, what's happened to the lady? And I, so I ran back to meet her. And she had a pistol in her hand and cartridges. And she said, I just read the letter in, in, in broken English. She didn't speak too well. And, she, and, and I, I had said, uh, uh, she said to me, this will do you more good, I'm sure, than it will me. And she gave me the pistol and a whole bunch of cartridges to go with it for, for the bullets. Well, boy, we were in Fat City. <laughs> we got to have bicycles now. So I, we, we stole with the bicycles. <laughs> and we, we drove, a, we, we rode a lot of miles on those bicycles. But we had that gun for security for ourselves. And, uh, so did, did, did you have reason to use the gun? When you got to the airfield? I did. I, we finally came to an airfield, and it was deserted. Uh, but there were still people there, but uh, uh, compared to where it really would have been a few weeks earlier. And airplanes were in revetments. And for those of you who are not familiar with revetments, that is a U-shaped uh, buildup of rocks or, or anything like this. And they park airplanes in them, and it's open at one end, and over the top they have a something like a tent structure, but it looks like trees from the air. And so that's what we did as well as the Germans. We hid our airplanes under those kind of situations at airfields, and they're not seen by the reconnaissance airplanes that come over and find out how many enemy air airplanes you got on a different airfield. It's hard to know. You couldn't tell. And so I went from revetment to revetment because the Germans had deserted so much that there were only a few of them walking around. And 
I saw the one come around and I told my friend, uh, whose name was Jerry Annis, that I escaped with, I said, I'm going to put the gun on the next mechanic that comes by, and I could tell by the uh, attire he had on, uh, and mechanic suit, and I motioned him into the hangar with the gun like this. And he came over to the hangar, and uh, we couldn't communicate. And my friend Jerry said, Bob, he said, I taught French in high school before I joined the service. I'm going to see if he can speak French. We clicked, and he spoke French. And he told, he told the, the German, uh, he said, uh, I'm going to shoot you if you don't help Bob start the airplane. Well, the Focke 190 was not foreign to me because Gus Lundquist, another friend of mine who was a test pilot at Wright Field, was sent over to England to check out in all of the captured German airplanes that the British had. And he got, he talked to the general into letting him fly one mission because he wanted to fight, but he was stuck as a test pilot at the right field. He had checked out at all of these airplanes and just spent 10 hours flying a Focke 190. And I found out that he had been at right field where I wanted to go after the war. And I went over and started visiting with him. He didn't want anybody to know that that he was from right field or what he'd done or anything. And it, it didn't get out to any people hardly at all. But he revealed to me that, that he, that's where he was stationed. And he, at, I said, there's that Fockwolf airfield right near here. And we, see, we would see them fly over. And I said, I would, I would sure like to know how to start that engine. And he said, well, I'll draw you pictures. And we'd get out in the, in the, the dirt where after we'd be counted every day. And he would sketch off where the instrument panel was and everything. Well, eight months later when I got out, I got in that 190 and I looked at everything. And I, I, I thought, gee whiz, I'm in, I'm in a world of trouble. And I said, Jerry, we got to figure out some way to, the man that he put the gun, I had brought into the Redman, he told him, he says, if you don't get it, that engine started and get him off the ground, you're dead. And boy, this guy started shaking and boy, he turned pale white. And I got in the cockpit and he helped me. And I thought I knew something about it, but it's been so long since Gus had uh, checked me out. I didn't do anything. I just checked the engine, ran it up. I knew it was okay. It had a lot of bullet holes in it, but it was full of gas, so I knew that it, it was flyable. So you didn't have a parachute. You didn't have a cushion. I had nothing, and uh, could I you see down. over the? Could you see over the? No, the problem was this is the funniest thing. Uh, I, I didn't have a cushion, I didn't have a parachute, and so when I got in, I'm now, instead of sitting up like this, I'm now sitting here like this, looking out, and he got it started, and I thought, boy, the, there's still guys up in those gunman sites around the field. I don't, I'm not going to taxi out, so I just ran the engine up until I got full power, <laughs> release the brakes straight out and then up as steep as I could get. And then I thought, you are the dumbest aviator that ever flew. The war is almost over and you idiot, you're trying to go in an airplane. What the hell are you accomplishing? And the answer is nothing. And so I was not proud of it. I got to mind telling you. And then I thought, boy, I, any young second lieutenant right out of flight training could have shot me right out of the sky. And I, I wouldn't have defended myself no matter what. And 
Foster, there was a cloud deck at about 4,000 feet. And I, so I just got up to the edge of the, the cloud and level and stayed there. And I thought, if I see any American airplanes, I'll just duck up into the clouds and then wait a few, few minutes until maybe they quit looking and dive out and try to get free. I never had a problem. I never saw another airplane. But I went over many airfields, had full tanks of fuel, and I was headed for Holland because I wanted to see windmills to be sure that I was in favorable country and they were on our side. Well, I, I, I got to Holland, saw the windmills, so now I felt safe. And I just couldn't find any place to land. And, but I had an open field. My gas tank was registering close to zero. And I thought, better get it on the ground while I've got control. And so I circled the little place. It looked like it was a pretty good field. So I put the gear down and landed. And I, when I got on the ground, I could see a ditch that I had not seen from the air. And I was headed right for it. And I could picture myself hitting the ditch, flipping upside down, being trapped there, and nobody would ever find me. Well, I ground looked. I just reached down and sucked up the gear, booted full rudder, and it, it skidded to a stop on its belly. And I sat there, there's nobody anywhere, and I thought, you are no question the dumbest pilot that ever lived. <laughs> and so I, did, I sat there for a few minutes and said, what the heck are you going to do now? Well, I got out and didn't have to carry anything because I didn't have anything. And I headed for some trees because I had seen a little dirt road on the other side. And I went into the trees, and I was wondering, you know, what if I could, was heading in the right direction. And all of a sudden, pitchforks came at me from every direction. And they were all Dutchmen who had seen me land in the German airplane with swastikas on it. And they hated the Germans like you couldn't believe. And boy, they had pitchforks. And I put my hands up and kept pointing like that and yelling, American, America. Nobody could understand me. And we got on the other side of the trees, and I was still had my hands up, and there was some dirt road there. And as the good Lord helped out, a truck uh, from a British truck came by, and it had two, two men in it, and I was still holding my hands up and I was waving them like that. And the vehicle stopped and I said, I hope you can help me, I'm a Yank. And they think I'm a Kraut because I just left a German airplane over there in that field on the other side of the trees. They say, I see you, old chap, up in. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's, not a horror story, it's a stupid story. <laughs> and for a year and a half, or maybe two years, I wouldn't tell that story to anybody in the world. I didn't, I was so embarrassed and, and, I, and felt so stupid about it. But all of a sudden, everybody tried to act like I'd done something great. I didn't do anything great. I did something very stupid, but my friend, came to an air show, and he had read about it in the paper, and some one of the little people that keeps people out of the, the crowd away from the airfield came over and he said, uh, Mr. Over, this man over there that said he was in prison camp with you. And my narrator, uh, who flew one of my airplanes from one place to the other, he said, God, Bob, there must have been 100,000 people in that prison camp. Every time we go to any, any air show, somebody comes out and says, he was there. And I said, well, they started out with 1,000 and ended up with 10,000 prisoners. And uh, I got 
I got to be known by a lot of people, but he said, it looks like to me you must have been with ten thousands of people. <laughs> that wasn't the case. But he, they thought they wanted to interview him. And I, before I could shut him up, he started telling this story. And suddenly my embarrassment was coming out in front of the whole world. It's been there ever since. And I was no hero. I didn't do anything but be stupid. That's <laughs> all there is to it. Bob, P-47, this airplane behind you. Any memories of the P-47? I've got, I've got some wonderful things to tell you. When I was, I was, ch I was one of those chosen to be the test pilot, the number one test pilot on the Bell X-1 first rocket ship. And uh, uh, my friend Chuck Yeager was a maintenance officer in the flight test, but he had not been through any of the test pilot schools. And uh, I had the assignment, and this is kind of interesting, I think, seriously interesting. Uh, we were flying P-80s, and uh, I was testing an airplane uh, that uh, that was in the research uh, stage, and we we had three of us on the on the thing, and we were now working towards breaking the sound barrier. Now, most people said, "What in the world is the sound barrier?" Well, it is a point, and I'm. It's a very technical thing, but I'm going to make it simple. Where the wings are attached to the fuselage on an airplane, when you get past 500 miles an hour, which is about eight tenths of a Mach number, Mach number one is speed of sound. That's what we couldn't achieve, and we tried it. I flew P-40, I flew P-51s first, and I got the P-51 up to about Oh, a little over eight tenths, which is 500 miles an hour, starting out as high as you could climb, about 45,000. And with the P-47, the same thing. And uh, the, the controls would stiffen up, and it's called hysteresis. The, the, the forces of the wind will suck your elevators up, and you have a lot of uh, wiring, and that's it's stretching, and it stretches, and the, suddenly the airplane has no control. You're sitting there, and the stick is in concrete until you slow down. So if you got up a, over a certain speed, you had this. So that's why they called it a sound barrier because, and that's hysteresis for the stretches of the of the cables, and then the air can do what it wants to. And if it sucks them up, which it does, and some of the tests I did with different airplanes, it sucks them up. Then the airplane pulls a P-40 or P-39 at about 400 miles an hour. You pitch up, because I had to do it with every type of airplane. And uh, so I, there was a P-47. I used all the earlier airplanes that were not fast enough, but the P-51 and the P-47 I could actually get them to 500 miles an hour. And with 500 miles an hour on this airplane, I felt better in it, but it too would be stiffened up, and you aren't going anywhere. You're going in the direction you're pointed when you get up to 500 miles an hour. And so in my test program, there were three of us working on it, and the first one, we had a motor uh, that was driving a piece of, of uh, controls that were added on the tail. We were trying to break down this turbulence of airflow that kept you from going up speed of sound. And what we did was uh, we, we would 
we had a, a, an electric motor that drove a device we had put on the horizontal stabilizer back just where the elevators are at the hinge point. We put a, a flat plate. Say, nobody knew had any re they didn't have any research, but a flat plate about this wide that went to span from the fuselage out to the tip. And to pull that up was like putting your flaps up. And what they wanted us to do was to go out to whatever Mach number we could get. And uh, with the P-47, I felt better in it than I did in the other airplanes. And this final day came along. First, first pilot was killed. And he, he got killed when the, the canopy came off uh, when he was in the dive. And it, when it, it dished into the cockpit, and we found his head and his helmet about, I'd say, 2,000 feet away from the, the wreckage. And there were three of us on that program, and I was the junior person, the youngest also. And... Uh, the other fellow and myself said, it's, it's far more risky than, than we considered it to be. And, uh, we, and engineering, we're trying to figure out what to do next. And I said, well, I suspect that that electric motor didn't have enough power and he couldn't get it to go to the different ratchets that you had to go to get the thing elevated to get through compressibility. And so I said, why don't you put a big motor on it? And so they put a big motor on it, and second pilot lost the canopy, and the head came, his head came off. Same thing, found the wreckage, found the head. Did this give you pause about continuing this program? <laughs> My turn next, and I thought, I don't think I like this job. <laughs> but I said, let's, let's make that stick manual. And this is where the P-47 really comes in. I said, put a stick over here, just back of the throttle quadrant. It goes all the way to the floor. There's a big steel pipe like this. And, and put the controls, and instead of the motor, I want to physically have this go all the way up telescoping until I could get to the top of the canopy. And if you look at the canopy, you can see how the, the shape is high here. It goes back like this. And I had that to go all the way up. And I could reach up then. I've had my both shoulders broken, so I can't raise my arms. But I'd raise it as high as I could. And, and then I could pull a little thing I had and I could make it go a notch at a time. And so I did a lot of flights before the, the bad one. And I, I'd get it going, and I, I thought I had it made. And, and I, I still not stuck at lower speeds. And so I, I kept working at it. And finally, I got to where I could, I could pull it. And I, my chase pilot said, Bob, you've got to pull out of that dive. You don't, you're, you're running out of altitude. I said, I've done everything I can, and I don't, don't, don't know if I'm going to make it or not. And so I finally got the ratchet to work, and it went to so many Gs. Now look at this airplane. The wings buckled right at the fuselage. See where the gear goes into the well? Where the gear goes into the well, is that's what holds the landing gear up. And the airplane, I was at, I was at, at point eight three, and that was just slightly over 500 miles now vertical. And I was about 9,000 feet. And I heard the, the loudest noise I'd ever heard. 
biggest explosion. I mean, it was just dynamite. And I, that's the last thing I, I heard was, was this horrible noise. And I was unconscious. And 15 minutes later, I had the airplane trimmed just right when I went unconscious. I was unconscious because I pulled G's that were beyond human survival, actually. And nobody could figure out how I got away with it. But I guess I was stupid, and that must have been why. But There's that I, word keeps coming up again. That I, 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 I was pulling so hard on the stick. And when it, when it, when it, those wings buckled, it was that uh, terrible explosion. And the gear doors came off and took half of the tail on one side. And uh, when I came to, I'd been out, my chase pilot said, I heard my name called and I was like this in the cockpit. And I didn't know what had happened. And I kept thinking I was hearing somebody calling my name and I thought, where am I and what's going on? And uh, finally I, lo I looked up and I looked over and I saw my chase plane there just flying formation with me. And he said he'd been calling my name for 15 minutes before he saw any movement. And uh, then he started talking to me and saying, uh, are you, you think you're okay? And I said, uh, yeah, I said, I can't believe what I'm seeing. All these wings were sticking up like this. And I didn't have too much left, it didn't seem to me, but it was flying and all by itself. I wasn't, a, I wasn't on the controls. And so then I took over the controls and felt it out even with the tail, part of the tail missing. And uh, he said, get out of it, he said, you can't land it. I said, I, I don't believe the, the gear will stand, stand up and you could flip upside down and that'd be the end of you. Why don't you bail out? And I said, well, uh, see if the gear wiggles when I boot the rudder and, and skid it a little bit. That'll tell you whether it's locked in, the, in its locked position. And he said, well, the gear doors are gone. And I said, well, you can see the wheels. And he said, uh, they don't seem to be moving. And I said, well, that's good enough for me. He said, but it, it, you can still have the gear full. I said, if the gear is down, I'm gonna, gonna try to land it. There was no problem at all, it did land. I had to land hot though, because I didn't have enough elevator, but it, it worked out nicely and I landed. And uh, the airplane was totally destroyed. I mean, it was just a mess. But you made that's it. My, my, that's my horror story about the P-47. <laughs> but it was a wonderful airplane in combat. It was right alongside the P-51. Right. Bob, I have one more question. But, but before I ask you that, uh, remind everybody a couple of things. Bob will be over in the bookstore after. He won't sign books. They're pre-signed. But you'd be welcome to have a picture taken with Bob. That's in the bookstore after we've completed our program. And also, where is Kyle? There is Kyle over here waving her hand. We have challenge coins for any of you from war Warbirds this year. Any of you would like a challenge coin, just see Kyle uh, after the program is over. Bob, last question. When you see the American flag all your life, what does that mean to you? Shall I tell you a little short story? Sure. About here. One year I was over by my airplane waiting to, for my turn to take off. And uh, there were some cars parked by the, all of the performing airplanes. And I drove up in my car. <clears throat> and uh, I was just waiting for my turn to, to fly. And the national anthem was, was, was being played. 
and there were some teenagers next to a car at another airplane that was one of the performers and the national anthem was played and they didn't stand up and I yelled on your feet and boy it got a jump out of them and uh, they looked around where did it come from and I said you heard me and they stood on their feet and when National Anthem was over. I, I walked over to him and I said, don't you know what that meant? And the answer was, no, you know. I said, that's the American flag, the red, white, and blue. That's what this country stands for. I said, you're supposed to stand up. Think how many people have died trying to keep that flag flying. And he's Teenagers looked around like this, and I said, just believe me, we live in the greatest country in the world, and you've got to respect it, and you've got to pass that along to others. Stand at attention every time you hear that. And the end of the story is, I no more than got that out of my mouth, and I saw a giant stand up on the other side of the car, and it was the father of the two boys. And I thought, oh man, he's going to hammer me right in the top of the head. Well, believe it or not, he came over and shook hands with me. Happy ending. Thank you. Thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, um, yeah. Um, Sam, uh, Sam Bass and John Penny are going to do a walk around this airplane if you want to learn more about the statistics about this P-47. Thank you all very much. Bob Hoover, thank you, sir. Good afternoon, folks. My name is Sam Bass, and uh, thank you, David. And we have this P-47 here, and John Penny is the pilot, and it's owned by Rod Lewis, and it's Lewis Air Legends, and that's in Texas, right? Yes, it is, from San Antonio, Texas. And, John, tell us a little bit about this airplane as far as the specifications. Well, the P-47 is a very, very rugged airplane. It's really kind of a airborne tank, if you will. It was uh, one of the heaviest uh, fighters uh, designed and flown in World War II. It's powered by a uh, Pratt and White, Pratt and Whitney uh, R2800 engine with a uh, Hamilton standard prop. Develops 2,000 horsepower. 2,000 horsepower. Uh, the airplane has a uh, top speed of 500 miles an hour indicated airspeed, and uh, I've never flown it that fast. Not as fast as Mr. Hoover has, but um, it was. Used it was first flight was in uh, May of 1941 and it went into combat late in 1942. Primarily used initially right. as a long range uh, and medium Dr. range Dr. escort for the bombers flying over Europe. No, but then when the P4, P51 Hartman came in as Tanya. escort, it was uh, relegated to a ground attack role for our troops right. in the eighth air uh, and so, over in Europe. Well, what range did it have? It would uh, it could penetrate all the way with tanks on board, could go all the way to uh, Berlin. So it was about, um, oh, about a thousand miles range. Okay, now let's, it's, it's famous for its durability. Talk about its durability. Oh, yes. You know, I, I, I've been privileged to fly the P-51 and, uh, and the P-47 along with some other airplanes, but the P-51, if you get one bullet through uh, the cooling system of that airplane, you're done. I've heard stories uh, about P-47s that were over in the war over there that they got a cylinder shot off. Well, one cylinder shot off the engine, and the pilots were able to limp back across the English Channel and land safely in, in England. And I understand that there have been pilots that actually just huddled behind the, the engine back there and then 
and they, they finally the 109s just gave up trying to shoot them down, and they just kept flying. Is that correct? Well, yeah. The um, and uh, the airplane was not as maneuverable as a 109 or the P-51 or the Spitfire, uh, but uh, this airplane could out dive any of those airplanes. So the the 109 pilots had to figure that out pretty quick. Okay, tell us about the turbocharger that's back in the back end of it. The turbocharger, the air being used by the engine actually goes in a scoop right here in the bottom, and it goes all the way back to the turbocharger where there's a bump underneath the tail back there that you can see. And the turbocharger uses the exhaust gases that are rooted back there also to spin up, just like you do in a, in a turbocharged automobile. What's that? The challenge point. Then it compresses that air, brings it past a couple of intercoolers, and on up into the carburetor. That whole mechanism, you can that's the reason why the belly of the P-47 is so deep. And that whole mechanism, the turbocharging mechanism, weighs 2,500 pounds. However... With that turbocharger, the P-47 was capable of climbing up to 40,000 feet and getting just about to 400 miles an hour at 40,000 feet. So that's pretty doggone impressive. All right, now tell us about the arm on it. It's, 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 it's kind of like a tank, isn't it? Oh, it's, it's kind of like a tank. And this, um, I mean, in the history of Republic, it's kind of the precursor to the A-10, which is a tank killer, as you know. Uh, this has eight... 50 caliber machine guns. The airplane could also carry 10 5 inch high velocity rockets. And it could carry 2,500 pounds of bombs, which was half of the bomb load of a B 17. So think about that. All right, now this airplane, of course, was made famous by. Gabreski and, and some other Bob Johnson and that sort of. Tell us a little bit about Gabreski flying the airplane. Well, people think of uh, the P-51 as the uh, as a Messerschmitt killer, the Falkwolf killer and whatnot. Uh, Francis Gabreski was the highest scoring ace over in the 8th Air Force in Europe, and he shot down 28 airplanes with a P-47. And Robert Johnson uh, documented uh, 27 kills, but uh, anecdotally, uh, people think there was a tie between he and Gabreski. All right, tell us about the color scheme on this particular airplane, paint scheme. This color scheme, and I don't know who the, the name of the pilot, but this is an accurate paint scheme uh, from the 8th Air Force, from a pilot who flew over uh, in the 8th Air Force over there. So and what outfit was it in? I'm taking a hazy on that, I'm sorry. Just make up something, because they don't know the difference. <laughs> 317th or something, I don't know. How about the nose art? Tell us about the nose art. Well, the, the nose art, uh, that's what I was talking about, where it says balls oh, yeah, out. Okay, yeah. uh, we do have a historical picture of the pilot, and again, I'm, I, I don't recall his name, uh, standing next to this airplane over in Europe in World War II. Okay, now you've been flying this airplane for what, 10 years? Is that correct? I've been flying P-47s for 10 years. Uh, and then you I fly flew 51 one. also? Yes. Now, what does it mean to you to bring this airplane so that these veterans, the World War II veterans are disappearing, but the Vietnam veterans and the Korean veterans to this to see this airplane and how emotional they get when they see it. Oh yes, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to bring these airplanes to events where the veterans, who uh, some of them are still with us, flew the airplanes, and for people who um, would have, have aspired to fly the airplanes can see them perform and fly. And um, they, uh, every single one, they, they do get emotional. There's a, the other P-47 that I'm privileged to be able to operate is up at Payne Field with the Flying Heritage Collection. That airplane is called the Tallahassee Lassie. It was the P-47 that belonged to Colonel Ralph Reynolds. Ralph Reynolds is a, um, he's 93 years old. Well, he'd be 95 years old now, and his wife would be 92. And they're still both with us, still as sharp as can be. And the Tallahassee Lassie is painted up in his scheme that he had in World War II. And, and she was a beautiful lady, and she's still very beautiful. And uh, All right, now, when you, 10 years ago, when you, there were a lot of World War II veterans that could come out here to see it that were pilots, what kind of emotions did they have? Did they probably happy emotions and also sad, probably? Well, it's a mix. Some of them are, are overjoyed to be able to get up close to the airplane. Some of them do get emotional and teary. I 
touching it, getting close to it. Yeah. But uh, it was an honor and a privilege for me to allow Ralph Reynolds to get up and climb into the Tallahassee Lassie right. and sit in it. And, uh, and, and that was very, very special for him and for his wife. By the way, folks, uh, if you're here tomorrow at 1 o'clock, John's daughter, Heather, is going to be here. And she is famous. You've all read about her. On September 11th, she was flying an F-16. And her job was to put down a civilian airline. And it was a very emotional thing. Is that correct? That was a, uh, that was a very interesting and very difficult day. Just a, a short story. She and her squadron mates were in their squadron at Andrews Air Force Base. The world was at peace. All of a sudden, somebody said, hey, come and look at this. Somebody just attacked one of the or, uh, airplane crash in the World Trade Center. As things went on, Okay, thank you. I'll let you take a yeah, look at that. Yeah. Okay. As time went on, uh, it, they realized that we were under attack, and she and her and several of her pilot or squadron mates were just standing at the operations counter. The operations officer turned around, and Heather and her flight commander, which just happened to be standing there, said, "Heather, you and SAS go." So it wasn't like they searched her out. So she. Uh, doesn't want to be uh, described as a hero. She says that she's an accidental witness to history that day. But they were both launched and vectored out to, towards United Flight 93. And they had no armament on board except for some ball ammo for ballast. So they would have had about a one second burst of the gun. So they may have had to uh, ram the airframe uh, to try to disable it to bring that aircraft down to keep it from coming into uh, uh, Washington DC area. The airplane had already crashed, because I'm being honest to them because of all the confusion. But my wife Stephanie in the white shirt here. <laughs> That's Stephanie over there. She and I are very, very proud of how she performed that day. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you bringing your airplane here. It's a beautiful airplane, and I'm sure you're proud to fly it. The immortal aviation pioneer. Medal of Honor recipient and Air Force General, Jimmy Doolittle once called Bob the greatest stick and rudder man that ever lived. I don't know, but I'd take Jimmy's word for it. Bob was certainly the best I ever saw. But there is no Bob Hoover elevator speech. I can't tell you he was the first pilot to solo across an ocean nonstop or a combat fighter ace. He wasn't the first pilot to exceed the speed of sound or to walk on the moon. But I can tell you that Bob Hoover had the complete respect and admiration of the pilots who did those things. They knew that Bob Hoover not only possessed a transcendental gift for flying airplanes, but also a set of core values that invariably drove him to do the right thing for his fellow pilots, for his employer, for his country, for aviation. I was honored to be one of the celebrants of his memorial service when he left us in late 2016. I'll admit, I didn't always understand all the dimensions of Bob Hoover's gift. It took me a while to completely grasp all that Bob Hoover knew about flying and all that he had done in his life, a life that was so inspired, so courageous, and so fully lived that if you proposed it as a book or a movie, it would probably be rejected for being too far-fetched. But I can assure you that Bob's life and Bob's gift were real. They were as real as it gets.
it was during the Depression era, of course, when I grew up, and uh, my father had to work at two jobs in order to put food on the table. As soon as I was old enough, uh, I had to start earning my own money just for lunches and at school and uh, any spending money I wanted. And when I got to 16, I got a job in a grocery store on Saturdays. And as a result, I earned $2 a day. And if I got any tip for carrying out groceries, that would be another 15 or 20 cents. And I was so interested and enthused about aviation, I'd been building model airplanes and even some that you could fly with a rubber band. And when an airplane would fly over, I'd run outside and look at it. It wouldn't be very often, but it was a big thrill to me to see an airplane fly. And then I'd ride my bicycle to the airport, and it was quite a ride. And then I would get 15 minutes flying time, so it took me for a long, long time to get uh, enough hours to solo. And then once I soloed, I, I fought nausea throughout the whole time frame. Uh, just absolutely sick every time I'd get in the air. So I had to overcome that. But I kept pushing myself right into the, the threshold of, of nausea uh, every flight. And I'd keep doing it until I got over it. And then I went to something else. And at 18, when I graduated, I already knew what I wanted to do, and I'd already learned to fly. And I had encountered every obstacle you could find about not being able to fly. I found out my eyes were weak, and I also found out that uh, I had nausea, air sickness every time I got off the ground with my first flight. And that was devastating to me because I dreamed of nothing else. And I decided that I was not going to accept that I could not do what I really wanted to do, and that was to become a pilot. I was not going to accept that I could not do what I really wanted to do. Time and time again, throughout his life, Bob's resolve to speak and act according to his own conviction put him at odds with authority and often in very real physical danger. At the same time, that determination had everything to do with his greatness as an aviator and an American. Bob Hoover was 18 years old in 1940. He graduated high school that spring. College was never a consideration. He was laser focused on his dream of flying. In the Tennessee of that era, with money tough to come by, the most probable pathway to the cockpit for Bob Hoover was to join the Tennessee Air National Guard. By the time I joined, I was 18, I was in the service. And as a, an enlisted man, as a gunner, thinking if I joined the Air Guard, and that's what I did, that the pilots would probably give me some stick time, which they did. They were very generous. Flying time, stick time as pilots call it, is everything to a new pilot. Bob Hoover was a young man who had done every job he could from the time he was 12 years old, delivering newspapers, stoking coal furnaces, stocking grocery shelves in order to get stick time. I decided I'd start experimenting with maneuvers and I started teaching myself acrobatics. And I, I just thought, well, if the airplane will roll, 
what if you stopped it here and here like this? And so I started working on that. It didn't bother me. And I did it to eight points. Then I went to 16 points. And I was doing inverted maneuvers. This self-designed training program yielded an interesting result when Bob began flying in the National Guard. So I went off to flight training and I got there and got my first check ride. This instructor said, uh, I'd, like, I'd like to show you a slow roll. Is that okay? And I said, yes, sir. And uh, he did one and he said, uh, would you like to try it? And I said, yes, sir. Well, he said, you can do it as well as I can. He said, what else can you do? So. I did this for him and he looked at me, you know, in the mirror and shook his head. We got on the ground and he went into the commandant's office and he said, sir, I've got a problem. And the commandant said, well, just go ahead and wash him out if he's a problem. He said, you don't understand. He can fly better than me or anybody I've ever seen fly. Next thing I know, he called me in, the commandant did, and he said, uh, I want you to give check rides to all of the instructors. And so the whole time I was in primary, I didn't learn anything, I was teaching. Finally, they lowered the age from 21 to 18 for pilot training. And my commanding officer said, all the pilots say you've got a lot of skill, young man, and you don't have to go to flight training. We'll just commission, you're right here, and you can fly all of the airplanes. But for young Bob Hoover, that wasn't quite enough. I think we've got storm clouds over Europe, that, and I believe someday we're going to be in there. a conflict of war, and if we are, I want to be out there fighting, and... If, if I accept the commission here, I'll have an O in my wing shield, and that means observation pilot, and you cannot fly combat. And I had wanted to be a fighter pilot in the worst way. And so I asked him, I said, sir, could you get me an assignment to flight training so I could be qualified for combat? And he said, well, of course I can. Bob had vision problems all his life. He wore fairly thick glasses for as long as I knew him. But to be a fighter pilot in World War II, you needed to begin flight training with 20-20 vision. If your vision degraded during training, you might be allowed to fly with corrective lenses, but not to start with. Once again, Bob's gift provided the way around an obstacle. The flight surgeon who would test his vision had seen him fly. And he said, uh, all the air guard pilots tell me, how skilled you are, and he said, I want you to pass this exam, but I'm concerned that you're going to have to work awful hard to get it. So he was trying to clue me. Sergeant, he said, I've got a, a couple of things I've got to do in my office, and when I come back, I want you to read that bottom line for me. So he gave me about 30 minutes to memorize the letters in two lines, the two lower lines, that I couldn't read. It's, it's sort of an interesting thing. I went through the same flight training as a cadet did. And when we, when we graduated, I was still a sergeant. And all the rest of the people were officers. And they didn't have any experience like I had at all, but yeah, I was a sergeant, and when, I, when we went into fighter training, uh, I was a, made a flight leader just right off. Uh, well, then about a month later, my commanding officer called me in, and he said, uh, I'm putting you in charge of 67 fighter pilots, and you're headed for England. Now his country needed defending, and he had managed to become a trainer of trainers. He could barely contain himself.
I was enthusiastic. Uh, I had high ideals and expectations because I had learned a lot of things about aviation that other people had not had an opportunity to do. But Bob had another obstacle to overcome. The Army Air Corps' plan for him did not include flying combat. We got to Africa, and when we arrived there, I was the first to get an assignment. And boy, I was just anxious to go. And I checked in to where I had to check into, and they said, we're separating you from your men, and you're going to be testing airplanes, taking them up for their first time. They're coming overseas in ships. And we've already got two shiploads waiting now to be assembled. And when they get them assembled, you're going to fly them around and check them out until they're ready to go to combat. I said, boy, I, I wanted to go to combat. We had a few uh, uh, translators who were French, and uh, they could communicate with them, and we had some people who could communicate with the French. Well, that's a hell of a way to build an airplane. And they assembled these airplanes, and I tell you, it was death-defying. Uh, every time I flew, there'd be something wrong, drastically. And I'd have to fly the same airplane sometimes six or eight times to get rid of all the squawks to make sure that it was ready to go into combat. That was with P-40s and P-39s. Though disappointed at not being in the fight, Bob took to the flying as he always did. Every time I fly, even to this day at my age, I want to do it better than the last time I was in that airplane. And I'm, I try to be more precise, whether it's aerobatics, keep my hand in uh, with, with all phases. Loyalty was a watchword with R.A. Bob Hoover. His friends, his fellow pilots, the Air Force, his country. Anyone or anything who mattered in Bob Hoover's life could count on his unfailing loyalty. Probably no one knew that better than his friend and fellow Air Corps pilot, Tom Watts. Tom and I took two new airplanes with external tanks and went around the enemy territory to get to Tulerma. And we signed off the paperwork and we were planning on waiting for a C-47 to pick us up. The the colonel in command of that fighter group said, we've got two airplanes that have a lot of battle damage, but they're okay to fly, but not okay to go into combat with. Tom said, if the engines check out okay, let's go for it. But Tom's airplane quickly developed a problem. Bob, I've got a rough engine. I'll go back and see the puffs of black coming out of his exhaust stacks. And I said, uh, Tom, do you see that little plateau over there on the top of that mountain? And he said, yes. I said, that's the only chance you've got. I said, or else you'll bail out and we'll never find you in these mountains. And I said, why don't you take a look at it? and make your decision. And so he looked at it and he said, I'm going for it. And he got down and got stopped. Bob later wrote, I knew Tom would never have left me in a similar situation. I was determined that we'd either both make it back or neither one of us would. Tom Watts later wrote, he pulled around and dragged the field. Then his gear moved down slowly and locked. Was this damn fool going to land? 
He did, and it was a beauty. He brought his ship over alongside of me. My buddy wouldn't leave me. The P-40s Bob Hoover and Tom Watts were flying were single-seat planes, and only Bob's was flyable. Bob somehow flew both of them home with an open canopy. We tried to squeeze him in, and I took my parachute off and just used the seat, the parachute as a seat cushion so I could see out adequately. And he put his feet down in here like this on the sides of the seat and then leaned over and this much of his head over here, this much was sticking out in the wind. You couldn't close the canopy. And my face was against the gun sight. Well, I took off and I decided we couldn't get above 140 knots because he's going to be in the wind with his face. And he had his eyes protected and his little other helmet on. And uh, we were looking good on the fuel for making it. But it was a miserable experience for, I guess, I suppose two hours. My face pressed against the, the gun sight. And his mouth was torn back to the corners of his lips here from the wind catching his mouth when he tried to say something. Or, and we got there and it was almost dark. I said, I've got a May Day, and uh, explained the situation to the controller, and, and we went in and they cleared the field because I, I didn't know if I was going to be able to land it because I was slid down in the seat too, and I didn't know if I had enough room to pull the stick or if I could see well enough. And uh, I was really planted against that head, that, that uh, gun sight. And we got on the ground and uh, and taxi in okay and I looked at his face and boy I couldn't believe it and he said look at yours when you get a chance I was black and blue from that gun sight on the side of my face well he was black and blue the next day and uh, we were two happy clowns but that to me was the most outstanding thing that I did in World War II Remember, Bob had refused the offer of automatic commission as a flight officer because that kind of commission would have left him unqualified for combat. And combat was his goal from the beginning. In the course of doing his job in the ferry command, specifically delivering new P-40s to a fighter unit, he took his destiny into his own hands. Got all six P-40s on the ground safely, and I went into the tent to do the paperwork, and they were putting all of their gear into the B-25. And a two-star general, I looked up, and there he was, and he said, young man, I'd like to talk to you about your mission. And uh, I said, sir, I said, I came into this Air Force to work, fly for our country and, and fight the enemy. And I said, I had a taste of it in England. And each assignment I've had since has had nothing to do with combat. And I said, I think I'm as qualified to, to be a good fighter pilot as anybody could be. I said, I can hit the target consecutively, right side up or inverted. And I said, I can hit a target out of four consecutive loops. And that means every loop has to be perfectly round to be in position to fire in the target each time you come through. And it's very difficult. Most people do loops and they're sort of l shape. You move out. And he listened to me and he said, young man, he said, that's a hell of a story. He said, if you can really fly that well. And I said, well, sir, you could contact Colonel McNichol because he's watched me do these demonstrations I do. And, and I said, he told me if I could ever get a transfer, that he'd make me a flight leader if I could get an appointment to his outfit. And he's in the 52nd Fighter Group. He commands it. He said, son, you'll have your orders within two weeks. 
But things weren't quite that simple. Perhaps they never are. But then again, this is Bob Hoover we are talking about. Nothing happened. Weeks went by. Nothing happened. And I was getting other assignments. and I was just down in the dumps in the worst way. And finally this sergeant called me, and he was a, a clerk for this Colonel Epright, whom I reported to as head of the ferry command. He said, Mr. Hoover, your orders have been on the colonel's desk since you went on that trip to Sicily. And he said, I asked the colonel when he was going to tell you about it. And he said, I'm not going to tell him about it. I'm not going to let him transfer. I'm going to keep him right here. I picked up the phone and I called the colonel. And I said, Colonel, I just had a phone call from headquarters, fibbing. And I said, they wanted to know why I hadn't reported for duty in Sicily. And he said, because I'm damn well not going to let you go. He said, I, I cannot operate this thing without you. And I said, well, sir, I, I'm really disappointed you feel that way. And he said, well, you've got to get that in, in your head that you're not going to be able to get transferred. And so I said, well, thank you, sir. And my next flight was to Palermo, Sicily with Spitfires to the 52nd Fighter Group. Yep, you guessed it. Once he got to the 52nd Fighter Group, knowing the general's orders were in fact sitting on his boss's desk, he had no intention of returning to the ferry command. I put my foot locker in the back of the airplane and I took two co-pilots I'd been training to be, my, be a pilot on the B-25. And I had led Spitfire, six of them, into Palermo, Sicily. And when I got there, I said, fellas, you're on your own. And I took my foot locker out of the airplane and I asked someone, someone on the line to take me over in a Jeep to the colonel's office. And boy, he put his arms around me and he said, oh, I've been hoping this day would come. And he said, I've told all of the people in this fighter group about your expertise. And he said, I want you to put on a show for all of them. And so he brought all the three squadrons were located in different places into Palermo. He got everybody assembled and he said, you're going to see something you've never seen before. But I want you to know one thing. If I catch any one of these fight, you fighter pilots trying to duplicate what you're going to witness, I'm going to have you grounded. Bob Hoover believed his bosses believed, and those who saw him fly fighters in those days believed he was simply the best there ever was. Which makes what happened to him in combat all the more surreal. The day I was shot down, we were dive bombing some transports, uh, feeding supplies into to the Germans in southern France there. And, uh, we were attacked by four Focke-Wolf 190s. And we just pulled off of the target of releasing our bombs and we were all split up. I pulled out of a break like this and I was up about almost 90 degrees and I saw this Focke-Wolf out here and I just ignored it. And about that time, whew, I was hit, and it, believe it or not, it was a 90-degree deflection shot. Well, I, I knew I had no choice. The fire was so bad, I just rolled it upside down, and I hoped that they were, it wouldn't hit me again. And I just rolled it upside down and fell out, hit the water, got tangled up in my parachute uh, lines, and then I sat there in the water and I had shrapnel that came all through the bottom of the airplane. And I was in the water uh, all, all afternoon and a German Corvette was searching for two of their pilots that uh, had gone down and they found me. 
and I remember for as long as I lived trying to sink my escape kit because I didn't want the Germans to catch it. I'm sure by then they must have had hundreds of them. But it was a little encasement that had a, a, a saw, a little saw blade encased in rubber, which you inserted in your rectum. And it had a map, a cloth map of the area we were fighting in. And it had some uh, chocolate bars, some other things that could keep you from, from severe pain. This, uh, it was a Corvette and it had a, a, like a ladder coming down with a platform on the bottom right near the water line. So finally they had a long pole with a hook on it and they hooked me and pulled me onto that platform. Being a prisoner of the Germans was a new reality for Bob, but it didn't change him. It just gave him a new set of objectives. They took me off and put me in a dungeon, and uh, I lived with the rats for the next day or so. And then they took me out for interrogation. They took me to a real fine hotel that was a billeting spot for all the German officers in that area. And the families were with them in some cases, and they tied me up on a big column in the, in the lobby with my hands behind me like this and the wives would come by and spit on me and slap me and I, I, I did understand why because so many of them had lost their families and their homes and the bombings that that we were doing and and I endured it of course I was mad and a haunted at the time it was happening but as I reflected on it uh, well I had the wrong attitude. I wanted to escape, and I never quit trying till the day I did. Bob endured 16 months in that camp. He repeatedly tried to escape, but was caught, beaten, and put in solitary each time. But gaining his freedom was now Bob's focus. And I believe determination was the engine that drove Bob Hoover in every circumstance of his life. Bob was in that camp so long that the Allies had nearly defeated Germany. In fact, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces in Europe, issued a new order to pilots and airmen being held in German prison camps. It told them to stop risking their safety with escape attempts because they would shortly be liberated anyway. But again, this is Bob Hoover we are talking about. I ignored that. I kept right on attempting to escape because I wanted out. The war in Japan was still going on and I wanted to get in on that. The day I got out, I got a diversion going. I got some of the fellows that I'd worked with on the, some of the escape attempts to start a fight and uh, once they started the, the fight got all the guards attention but half of the guards had deserted by then we could hear the big guns about oh 50 70 miles away and uh, we got to the other side and now we were away from the germans for the most part out in open countryside after three days on the run in Germany, a very hungry Bob Hoover and his fellow escapee came to a farmhouse occupied by the wife of a German officer. Her husband was based elsewhere. Luckily, she spoke English. In exchange for some food, Bob wrote her a letter to give to the advancing Allied troops. The letter asked the Allies to treat her kindly because of the help she had provided him. As he was leaving, she also gave him a pistol. Bob was on the hunt for a German airplane he could use to fly himself to the Allied lines and freedom. As he continued to move around the German countryside, he was in and out of the lines of the Russian troops. The Russians were vengeful enemies. Bob witnessed unspeakable brutality inflicted on Germans by the Russians. 
Eventually, Bob made his way to a deserted airfield and started looking for an airplane. Finally, I found one that was full of bullet holes, but the engine was okay and it was full of fuel. And I said, I'm gonna wait till a mechanic walks by here and I'm gonna put the gun on him and bring him in here and help him get me the airplane started. And so finally a, a German mechanic did come by and I pointed the gun at him and yelled and he and I motioned for him to come into the revetment and he walked in there. Boy, he was just, we put his hands up and his face was just pale as a ghost. The Germans showed Bob how to start the Focke Wolf 190 airplane and Bob decided it would be too risky to taxi the airplane slowly out to a runway. He simply firewalled it out of the revetment where it was parked. Well, I let it go, and I went straight out of that revetment, got airborne, got the gear up, and there was a 4,000-foot ceiling. And I no more than got off the ground, and I started thinking, you know, this is the dumbest thing you've ever done. Here you are in an enemy airplane and the war's not over and I, I Air Force people come in and see you. They're gonna take an easy pot shot at you and you did. And I headed north until I got to the South, uh, North Sea. Then I swung west and I thought, if I've got enough fuel to get to Holland, I'll see windmills and I'll know I'm in safe country. Bob had eventually landed the German airplane in a field in Holland. What he had no way of knowing was that under Nazi occupation, the Dutch population had experienced the highest per capita death rate of any country occupied by Hitler's forces. Now that they had been liberated, the local population was not likely to warmly welcome a pilot who had emerged from a German airplane. He was immediately surrounded by farmers with pitchforks and other weapons. They were marching him down a road when they encountered a British convoy. Bob was able to describe his situation to them, and the Brits intervened. It was sort of a hair raiser and a, and a, a very dumb thing to have done. Uh, you know, the war was practically over, but I had all I'd thought about every day, all day long, was getting out and, and, and capturing one of their airplanes. And I was just so motivated. The day Bob Hoover stole that German airplane and flew himself to freedom. He was 23 years old. The war in Europe was within months of being over when Bob escaped. Plans to turn our attention to the Pacific and Japan became moot with the atomic bombings of the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August 6 and 9, 1945. After getting home, Bob wrote, I had spent nearly two and a half years overseas. It was an experience I'll never forget. I had seen the extremes of bravery and brutality, of kindness and cruelty, of loyalty and cowardliness. Above all, I knew more than ever what it meant for one to lose that precious gift of freedom. When you first lose your freedom, and I've said this to so many young people you don't know what we have here in this country till you can't see that red white and blue flag you don't know what that stands for that's freedom Films of the Army's newest fighting plane, the jet-propelled P-80 Shooting Star. The P-80 is believed to be the fastest fighter in existence. The secret of its spectacular speed lies in the new knife-edged wing and its powerful kerosene-burning jet engine. World War II was the dawn of the jet age. Few inventions have done more to shrink the geographic and cultural distances between peoples than the jet engine. We are now in our third generation of people who take the speed, reliability, and comfort of jets for granted. 
In part, we can thank Bob Hoover for that. Bob Hoover became a U.S. Air Force test pilot following the war. He was one of a handful of pilots who took on the arduous and dangerous task of flying the new jets, including America's first jet, the P-80. It was uh, an experience for those of us who flew some of those early jets. You see, you had to, we had to change engines. Started out at two hours, and then we got up to five hours and into ten hours, just for the life of the engine. And so there was always maintenance going on with the jets. They, were, they didn't have a fuel control, and most people wouldn't understand this, but in starting a jet engine back in those days without a fuel control, you were the fuel controller. And you'd do it like this when you'd start the engine because if you let the, the, if the RPM didn't start moving upward when you were trying to start it, you'd overheat the engine so you glued your eyes to the tailpipe temperature and the RPM and it would take you maybe two or three minutes to get an engine started because then when you once got it started, to go from idle to taxi speed, you couldn't just put the throttle up. You had to ease it up and ease it back again, watching the temperature and RPM. And now to get up to speed, engine speed for takeoff, you'd have to sit there and play with it like this again. And now this meant that after you finished your flight and wanted to land, there was no margin for error because if you were found you were too slow or, or short of the runway, you'd never get the throttle up there to get the power to make you reach the runway. Something to think about the next time you sink into your seat on an airliner. While assigned to right field, Bob quickly learned that being a test pilot during the day paid certain dividends when he and his friends went out in the evening. On a blind date in Dayton, he met Colleen Humrichhaus. She later said, the thing that held Bob back was my maiden name. He used to introduce me as Colleen Jones. Her name soon became Colleen Hoover, and it remained so for 68 years until her death in March of 2016. Bob Hoover was a true Southern gentleman. I flew with him on the air show circuit for so long, and we became such close friends that it was easy to think of him as just one of the guys. It was easy to forget what an important role he played in aviation history. For example, guess who demonstrated the jet airplane to the inventor of powered flight, Orville Wright? The colonel asked me to take this one airplane, and it was on a test phrase, and, uh, and I, I put on an aerobatic demonstration for him. And I, he came over to the airplane. He had a, some people with him, of course. And I was getting in the airplane, and he shook hands with me and, uh, and told me he was, he was interested in watching me fly. And then when I came back, why, he congratulated me. And, and that was just a couple of handshakes. But I was all inspired by saying that I'd met the man. That's just another thing that's a little hard to get your head around when considering the life of R.A. Bob Hoover. He was born just 14 years after Powered Flight was invented. He personally met Orville Wright. He flew anything and everything for the next six decades as a combat pilot, military test pilot, civilian test pilot, and an executive at North American Rockwell, the aerospace company that built the command module for the Apollo moon landing program and the space shuttle orbiters. Bob Hoover painted on a canvas that stretched from Kitty Hawk to the moon. Albert Einstein said, intellectuals solve problems, geniuses prevent them. Preventing problems was indeed the genius of Bob Hoover. As a test pilot, he knew that any problem he discovered could be solved before mass production was begun. In the world of aviation, that meant saving lives. 
Bob suffered no fools and made no compromises when it came to the hard realities of building safe airplanes and flying them properly. But standing one's ground in test flight often means speaking truth to power, and that can have consequences. One of the issues with the new jet airplanes was that their engines ran on jet fuel or kerosene, not gasoline. That was going to mean setting up a whole new fuel distribution system around the world or finding a way for the jets to fly on gasoline. After several tests of gasoline in the engines, it fell to Bob to perform an aerobatic routine for the Air Force brass. Bob later wrote, suddenly at 10,000 feet, the engine flamed out. He survived the crash landing with only very minor injuries. Later that afternoon, he was ready for another flight to test ramjets in a P-51 Mustang. Colonel Albert Boyd, the head of the test flight division at Wright Field, thought otherwise. He ordered Bob out of the airplane. Boyd had counted up the number of force landings Bob had and found them to be more frequent than other pilots in the division. Though Bob routinely took the riskiest flights, Boyd added, nobody else seems to be having these kind of problems. It was likely the beginning of the end of Bob's Air Force career when he replied, Well, Colonel, if you'd come down here and fly more often, you could assume some of the risks, too. In 1946 and 47, the race to break the sound barrier was on. America's entry was the X-1 built by the Bell Aircraft Company. The project's civilian test pilot, Chalmers Goodland, was scheduled to make the first supersonic flight. There are conflicting accounts as to why he did not. The net result was the news broke at the Wright Field Flight Test Center that the Air Force was seeking a volunteer to break the sound barrier. Several of the pilots, including Bob Hoover, applied. According to Bob Hoover's autobiography titled Forever Flying, Lieutenant Colonel Bill Council had chosen him to make the flight. But then Bob did a favor for a fellow pilot, a favor that changed history. I was selected for the X-1 program and was asked by a friend of mine who wasn't flying jets, fly over the Springfield Airport the first chance you get with the jet and I'll tell them it was me. That's mistake number one. In most of the jet test flights, every ounce of fuel was consumed. But on one flight, the weather was so bad, Bob could not get accurate data, so he broke it off. So I came back and I had a lot of fuel, and there was a Springfield Airport underneath. I I'll just make a trip across there upside down. I did. The numbers on the side of the airplane were small, and I never thought anything about it. Two months went by, and I was elated about being selected for the X-1 program. A new colonel came in, and he said, there, I just got a, a letter here saying that uh, Somebody buzzed the Springfield Airport on such and such a date. Was that you? I said, yes, sir, it was. He said, well, I know two things about you. You're honest because there was only one jet that flew in the whole United States that day, and you were in it. But I also know that you're not responsible. He said, you're going to help him out. You're going to live with him. You're going to fly with him. You're going to be his backup pilot. And I thought, oh, boy. You know, there were 16 people in that pyramid of candidates to get to that peak I had made. And now I've lost it all. Of course, history tells us that as a result of Bob's decision, one of aviation's most significant milestones, exceeding the speed of sound for the first time, was accomplished by his close friend, General Chuck Yeager, with Bob flying the chase plane. Interestingly enough, when the Allison Division of General Motors was looking for a chief test pilot and sought the Air Force's advice, Colonel Albert Boyd, the same Colonel Bob Hoover had accused of lacking the courage to make the risky flights, told them Bob Hoover was the best in the business and General Motors recruited him aggressively. You will be the highest paid 27-year-old in the General Motors Corporation if you accept this job. And they had just lost a pilot. And so I was accepted. And the first thing he said to me is, uh, I'll not only double your pay, 
but we will give you a brand new Cadillac of any design you want. You can give us the paint job and the interior. And all of the good is it would spark an interest in any young guy. So Bob Hoover became a civilian test pilot. And as you might imagine, the kid from Nashville, Tennessee, who purposely made himself sick in order to keep flying, became a legend in that world as well. There was a reason for Bob Hoover to title his book, Forever Flying. It was the tyranny of biology, age alone, that finally dragged him out of the cockpit for the final time. It's kind of funny, but when my generation of pilots encountered Bob Hoover, we didn't think, there's Bob Hoover, the guy who broke out of the prison camp and stole a German airplane. Or there's Bob Hoover, the guy who rescued his friend off a mountaintop by jamming him in a single-seat airplane. Or there's Bob Hoover, who could have broken the sound barrier. Or there's Bob Hoover, who laid healing hands on everything from the P-39 to the F-86, the F-100, the Sabreliner, and even the F-18. When I met him, he was just one of us, doing what he'd been doing since he was teaching the teachers in the Tennessee Air National Guard, demonstrating airplanes for people, but with superhuman grace and elegance. Nobody had a touch like Bob Hoover. Now the difficult thing to think about is, try to pour backhanded to see it on, on camera, Believe it or not, you can see the horizon going around as the tea is poured into the glass. He said at times you had to be gentle enough to milk a mouse. No matter how many offices or neckties they put him in, he always made them agree to let him keep flying. Bob Hoover was an artist, and his inspiration was the unknown. There's something about the unknown, and, and that's why I was so disappointed that I didn't get to make the first flight on the X-1. Every day you go out, you have no idea what the rest of the day it has in store for you. And you get used to that, the adrenaline flows, and you get excited about it, and you, uh, you feel motivated because if, if you can damage the enemy, that's why you're there. And I had... Uh, I've been doing aerobatics, and I was uh, sought after to perform and demonstrate different types of airplanes all over the world. And I enjoyed every one of those flights because they were in different countries, and uh, and and before people that were enthusiastic about flying and wanted to know more about it, and that in itself was a another bit of adrenaline flowing because I. I can tell you for a fact, you couldn't imagine how many accidents I've seen in my lifetime uh, where the pilots didn't survive. Bob Hoover's career covered an arc from the Wright brothers and Kitty Hawk to today's space age. His list of personal friends, admirers, and flying mates included Orville Wright, Charles Lindbergh, Jimmy Doolittle, Chuck Yeager, Yuri Gagarin, John Glenn, Neil Armstrong, and hundreds more. And most of them would agree with Jimmy Doolittle. He was the best there ever was. But if we miss the other aspects of Bob Hoover's gift, we miss everything. Courage, both physical and moral, loyalty, integrity, and the wild blue yonder, truth is uncompromising. To Bob, that could not change on the ground. Generosity, Bob never stopped sharing. Advice, knowledge, inspiration, opportunities. He knew sharing these things could save lives, so he shared them tirelessly. Patriotism. Nobody believed more strongly in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness than R.A. Bob Hoover. And I think something happened to him when he lost his liberty in that prison camp. The sanctity of freedom took up residence in his heart. 
You took your dignity in your own hands if you failed to properly respect the United States flag or a veteran in the presence of Bob Hoover. I was enthusiastic. Uh, I had high ideals and expectations because I had learned a lot of things about aviation that other people had not had an opportunity to do. I never felt that I was any better than any other pilot. I just felt this is what I want to do and I want to do it to the best of my ability. But what made my friend Bob Hoover so special and so important to aviation and the nation was not the gifts he possessed, it was his undying willingness to share them with the rest of us. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.